Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And in this video, I'm going to show you some documentation why I believe Ripple will play a major role along with the digital asset XRP to provide the fintech solution for the banking sector in a big way moving forward because we know about this World Bank and IMF together launch a learning coin, cryptocurrency. It's a quasi cryptocurrency. But what is the deal? Well, I'll tell you that this is a learning coin that will not be accessible outside the world of the IMF or World Bank. It has no money value. It has been developed to help staff become more familiar with DLT. So DLT is in the sites of the IMF and World Bank for sure. It will have possible smart contracts along with some uh, education about the enhanced transparency that it offers. The staff will be able to earn these learning coins. Yeah, through some education and uh, <clears throat> they will redeem them. Uh, for some kind of rewards. We don't know what those rewards are, but it is not uh, anything more than to show the IMF and World Bank are going to be moving forward in a big way with distributed ledger technology. This is a transitionary period and the goal is to promote knowledge. So if I take you back to January 2016, you can see the very first paper from the IMF on virtual currencies. It's very telling. It tells you where their head is was at at the time and boy they have come a long way. I'll put a link to this down in the description below. About 18 months after that we have an IMF publication and there is what is called straight talk from Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF. And it really is interesting because she talks about their role at the IMF and they serve as a forum for the exchange of ideas and a catalyst for forging consensus. So that is exactly what they're doing in this project is they are trying to form consensus. And if they do their jobs properly, she says, that they must understand the innovative technologies, learn from them, and perhaps even adopt some of them to improve regulation, supervision, and surveillance. If we had read between the lines, this is exactly what they're doing with the learning coin. So we have to sometimes put the pieces of the puzzle together when the puzzle pieces are presented. And above all, she said that we must keep an open mind about crypto assets and financial technology more broadly, not only because of the risk they pose, but also because of their potential to improve our lives. So this is then the speech that became very famous in November 2018. It's called the Winds of Change, the case for new digital currency. This is when she really got on the map. And in this speech, she says, I believe we should consider the possibility to issue digital currency. There may be a role for the state to supply money to the digital economy. And that is what they are planning to do. And they are just getting ready for this. Now, along with that speech came this publication, 39 pages. There is something I want to just cover. It said here, based on their research, that cryptocurrencies are different. This is from the IMF. Cryptocurrencies are different along with many dimensions and struggle to fully satisfy the functions of money in part because of erratic valuations. Examples include Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Now, this is why a couple of days ago I put together a video and I said that I just didn't think personally that XRP was going to meet the criteria to be a reserve currency. And I, you know, I'm open, anything is possible, but this is the narrative that I was reading and this is why I said what I did. However, there is a huge role for XRP and I want to continue with this video to show you. So the next part 
is this number 70. So looking ahead, the cross-border implications of the central bank digital coin raise a multitude of new questions that merit investigation. And you can see in this section that it is very complicated for the uh, coin to actually function uh, for the international remittances. It doesn't work. So should foreigners have access to this coin? And how do tourists uh, make payments in a foreign countries if they have adopted this coin? And the compliance issue with the know your customer and the anti-money laundering, that is very complicated. How do you do it across borders? And if the CBDC were used for cross-border transactions, how would or how might central banks be required to cooperate? Yes, we know this because of the fact that we need something that's neutral. And would they absorb some of the functions of correspondent banks and thus take on additional liquidity? I don't think so. And credit? No. And foreign exchange rate risks? No. So I can definitely see that the um, central bank issued digital coin doesn't answer all their needs. Now I'm taking you back to a picture which took place in March and this is a very high level advisory board for the IMF. You can see Mr. Garlinghouse here along with Christine Lagarde in the center and this is the person I want you to pay attention to. This is Jess Chang and she is an former Ripple uh, employee. And she had her own channel here where she uploaded a uh, IMF eye opener that she gave. And it's in regards to the real experience that she had in sending money back to her grandmother in Taiwan. She really understands the pain points and knows the friction. So working with the uh, company Ripple for three years. She learned how to take that chaos and turn it into clarity. She actually wrote the rules for them and is very much now doing some of the same with the IMF because she's serving as legal counsel on the IMF. Here is a presentation that she put together on DLT in cross-border payments back in September 2018. It was the um, Washington DC Law and Financial Stability High Level Seminar. And it's very interesting because I found the actual audio that goes with this slide presentation. Now listen to her talk about slide number. I think it's uh, it's either 15 or 16. Here, listen, have a listen. Usually 18 of so lifting fees to each of them uh, charges will add up. Also, Alpha Bank has very little visibility to what's going on downstream. It wouldn't know, for example, uh, when Beta Bank uh, pays Beta Corp. And the end-to-end -end transaction can take several days. So those are the pain points you often hear that DLT can solve for. So let, let's walk through an example now of how uh, DLT uh, can actually be used in this context. So. New hypothetical here. So this is you new. Still have Alpha Bank and Beta Bank, but let's say now they use DLT to connect to each other. So in that last uh, payment system example, both Alpha Bank and Beta Bank had accounts with Sigma System. Now we have the converse. We have an entity that has an account with Alpha Bank, and that entity also has an account with Beta Bank. Okay. Do you see that? This passive account holder appeared in the middle. And she says this new entity has a relationship with uh, the Alpha Bank and with the Beta Bank. Okay, now. So you can see the account relationships run in opposite directions. We have a common account holder now called passive account holder. The key difference here is that there could be multiple common account holders between Alpha Bank and Beta Bank that they can choose from for this transaction. So this is so interesting. So she says, as the passive account holder sits in the middle, uh, the bank will have a choice of what they would like to use within the passive account holder. So there's no reliance on any single intermediary. 
So this is a new hypothetical, and I think it really tells a lot. And actually, in summary, I do think that uh, the IMF is getting ready for everyone to be more than just acquainted with DLT, but to really understand it because this technology is going to roll out in a big way. Uh, it's no question in my mind that they are going to move forward with DLT and the use of a digital asset. And I think XRP will be the choice for the international remittances and it will sit here in this a passive uh, account holder as one of the options. Now I'm going to take you to some of the latest narrative that came out of Christine Lagarde. She spoke uh, for the spring meeting of the IMF and World Bank just a couple of days ago. It ended on Sunday and this is pretty much how she is summing it up. The, the role of the disruptors and anything that is using distributed ledger technology, whether you call it crypto assets, currencies, or whatever, and it's far from the Bitcoins that we used to talk about a year ago, that is clearly shaking the system. Uh, the voice that we heard, which was, I thought, really interesting, um, were those of the, the regulators and central bank governors who said, well, yes, this is good and this is helpful, and it is changing the business model of commercial banks. But we have to be mindful of two things, trust and stability of the system. And we Yep, so I think it's quite clear. Um, they're going to go cautiously, of, co of course, to maintain trust and, and stability of the system, but uh, they are going to um, roll this out, I'm sure of it. Okay, now I just wanna give you a laugh. In the very beginning of this interview, just, <laughs> it's, I want you to watch Christine Lagarde's body language here. When the word Facebook comes up. Okay, it happens very quick, so uh, watch carefully. But there was cryptocurrencies and all sorts of companies now getting into this effort, not least among them Facebook. What kind of threat does this pose to the traditional <laughs> banking system? Did you see what she wanted to do when the word Facebook was mentioned? She immediately went into a defensive crossing arms gesture, but then she caught herself and she opened up. Um, um, I just, it's just so funny. One more time. All sorts of companies now getting into this effort, not least among them Facebook. What kind of threat does this pose to the traditional banking system? <laughs> I think it was really clear that the word Facebook <laughs> created a huge reaction. It's really, really funny. Okay, everybody, I am moving to the fluff. So I have been feeling like uh, I want to share with you Something kind of special. There is a Buddhist monk. He is uh, very famous in Japan because he designs uh, award-winning Zen gardens around the world, literally around the world. And he is a high priest of a 450-year-old Zen Buddhist temple here in the Yokohama area, actually, which is right next to Tokyo. And in doing that, um, I started to think about, wow, you know, we all need a little bit of Zen meditation sometimes. And there are four cardinal behaviors with Zen, and it is uh, walking, standing, sitting, and lying, which means it never leads, leaves you. It's not something that you um, practice and then uh, uh, leave or, or something you read in a book. It's the way you live your life and it is in the form of simple living through habits. And so for 10 minutes a day, it is important to create an empty mind and that you can focus on something that is going to give you more clarity after you have meditated. So when we take a look at one of the gardens that he has designed, it's really lovely, look at this. We have these elements that are so important in a Zen garden. And I just wanted to talk briefly about these elements. So the rocks or stones uh, give you a sense of stabil stability, power, and actually tranquility. Let me show you another garden here. You can see how when you focus in your meditation and you look at these rocks, they will give you those factors. And then the sand is 
more looking like water. And that sometimes is even raked, but the deep reflection that it provides you when you meditate is the attribute of the sand. And when they do rake it and you get those lines, it provides you kind of a gentle flow or movement. And then the shadows are ever changing. So for minute by minute by minute, the garden will change. And that change of shadow is part of the beauty of a Zen garden. So if you come to Japan, and you want to experience some Zen training with real Buddhist monks, you can do it in Kamakura, and it's very tourist friendly. It's actually really designed for tourists. You can uh, join them for about 90 minutes, and it's just only $20 or so. At the end, they even serve you green tea and cakes, but they will teach you how to encounter your true self through that meditation. So if you want to experience the form of Zen meditation with a uh, full-fledged Buddhist instructor, this is a place for you to go. I'll put the link to this uh, temple in the description below. All right, everybody, I hope you can find your Zen garden and do some meditation because sometimes this space requires it. All right. Please take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.